resisting unprecedented pressure, including public violence and an attempted assassination of a sitting justice. The U.S. Supreme Court last week issued two six to three decisions demonstrating the majority's, well, resolve. In Bruin, the court struck down New York State's discretionary handgun licensing law as a violation of the Second Amendment. In Dobbs, it ruled that Mississippi cannot be deprived of its jurisdiction over abortion law. Was the court wise or foolish to turn a blind eye to public opinion about these momentous rulings? We will discuss this and more in this week's episode of Independent Outlook. Hello everyone, I'm Graham Walker coming to you today from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, where we try and bring you an independent take on the issues of our day. Uh, as always, I am joined by my collaborator and partner in crime, Williamson Evers. Hello, Bill Evers. Hello. Great to see you. <clears throat> Bill Evers is the director of our Center on Educational Excellence. Uh, we're also joined by our many friends who come to us via our YouTube page, Facebook, Vimeo, Twitter, and all those who join us through thinkspot.com. So for this unusual discussion, we're going to be joined by some experts on Supreme Court jurisprudence. Let me start with welcoming Stephen P. Halbrook, who is quite an expert on Second Amendment law. Dr. Halbrook, Steve, nice to see you. Good to see you, Graham. Thanks for having me. I'm very glad to have you. And nice to see you sitting in front of your legal credentials on the wall behind you. You're a pretty serious lawyer, I can tell. And in fact, for those who don't already know Stephen Halbrook, <clears throat> he's, he's not only a uh, a practicing lawyer, but also a senior fellow here at the Independent Institute. Uh, he has successfully argued three cases before the U.S. Supreme Court directly. And I think, Steve, you've been cited in written opinions on Second Amendment issues. Heller, McDonald, Prince are the three cases that I think I'm aware of where you were cited. And That's correct. No, I not only <clears throat> argued the three cases, but I won them. I have a yeah. better record in the Supreme Court than in any lower court. Good grief. <laughs> that's, usually it's the opposite, is it not? Yes. Yeah, that's that's pretty darn good. And of course, we're proud of him because uh, he not only is affiliated with us, but Steve Halbrick has published a number of books uh, with us on the subject of the Second Amendment. Oh, there are more than I want to show here, but just a couple. Uh, fairly recently, a couple of years ago, uh, Gun Control in Nazi-Occupied France, uh, very much worth reading. I recommend it strongly. Um, gives you an unusual perspective on the issues. And then most recently, uh, the right to bear arms, a constitutional right of the people or a privilege of the ruling class. Again, highly recommended, available on our website, independent.org, as well as on amazon.com, I'm sure. So Steve, you, you have quite a record on this. <clears throat> so you're the person I want to start with to talk about this ruling. I think it's called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Uh, first of all, I get who New York State Rifle and Pistol Association was, but who's Bruin? <clears throat> He's just a local official. It's kind of a, a nominal uh, respondent. Um, He's the party that happened to be the one who denied one of the licenses. Because he had he, to enforce the New York law. Right. Got so it. there's, there's um, petitioners included the, the association on behalf of its members. And then there were two individuals who were denied licenses to carry handguns for general purposes. They were restricted to very specific, narrow purposes. Got it. Well, this was issued uh, last Monday, last Tuesday, I think it was. If I recall, if I got that right, Steve? Y yes. Yeah. And, and I thought to myself when this ruling came out, now I'm going to say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but I thought to myself at the time, Oh, good grief with these mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde, Texas. I mean, shouldn't the Supreme Court be watching the news cycle? Don't they realize that it, it looks kind of like bad manners to come out with a ruling supporting uh, gun rights right in the wake of these of these terrible shootings? Have they no sense of PR? Why aren't they being guided in their decisions by PR considerations, Steve? Well, because they follow what the Constitution dictates and not to mention that there's no relation whatever between the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association and its law-abiding members and, and these um, scoundrels, these dirtbags who committed those shootings in uh, Buffalo, New York, and in Uvalde, Texas. Th these were people who um, took it upon themselves to take lives of other people. Um, their names are not worth mentioning. Right. As a matter of fact, we have so many means of law-abiding gun owners in this country, and their rights are guaranteed by the Second Amendment. 
And that's why the court ruled the way it did. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, in New York, they had had a mass shooting, I think last fall, was it? A guy on the subway. And I wondered to myself, did that guy get a gun through the legitimate exercise of what New York's law had been until last week? Or do you know? Um, I don't remember on that one, but I have to say about the, the mass shooter at the, the grocery store in Buffalo, New York, he bought a gun lawfully in the state of New York. It, it was a rifle uh, and, a, and a handgun. He passed the background check. He did everything that they required. And then they have a ban on so-called assault weapons, which um, basically bans cosmetic features of, of firearms. And he converted that legally bought New York compliant rifle to a so-called assault weapon. And, it, and that's what he used, although he could have killed the same people the same way with the New York compliant version. And, and another thing, um, the Buffalo shooting took place, of course, in a state with some of the most stringent gun laws, including against handgun carry. And um, in the dissenting opinion in the Bruin case, uh, Justice Breyer has a list of horrible things that have happened in our history, and they are horrible, the different shootings. But like Justice Alito pointed out in his concurring opinion, Buffalo, New York was on the list. And, and, and Justice Breyer is trying to say, oh, we should have laws like New York State. Mm -hmm. That's perplexing. I mean, which state has the most restrictive laws on guns or had until last week? Was it New York or is it California? Or do you know? I think there, some of them are a lot tighter than others. It depends on the subject. Hawaii has the most restrictive laws on carry. The only kind of carry that was allowed in that state would be if you're a security card, you could get a license to carry when you're on duty. And they were not giving out licenses to anybody else for any purpose. Uh, on the other hand, they don't have much of, so, of a so-called assault weapon ban. California has probably the most ridiculous, stringent ban on modern rifles they call assault weapons. It's just a pejorative propaganda term. So it, it really depends on what subject you're talking about. And with the right to carry, like in California or New York, you have some counties or localities where the, the sheriffs will issue licenses to carry the law-abiding people generally. And then you have other places like New York City or, Man or, or um, uh, San Francisco that, that would not issue licenses. So it, it was a, a, a patchwork of, of um, arbitrary um, administration of a law that gave, the, the statutes gave basically leeway to local officials to decide whether you were going to be entitled to exercise your constitutional rights. So that seemed to be the heart of the case with this New York law, wasn't it? That it wasn't simply that they could evaluate people um, or their objective criteria, but there was discretionary judgment exercised by state officials uh, who could basically on their own say so decide whether or not to allow a person to exercise his Second Amendment rights. Have I got that right? Yes, the New York law said uh, it, you have to have a proper purpose. And so in, if you were in Manhattan, and you were a billionaire, a celebrity, or you paid the right bribes, you had a proper purpose. You could get a, a permit to carry. If you were just a regular old common person living in a high crime neighborhood, that's not a proper purpose. You're just not important enough. Second Amendment talks about the right to bear arms uh, on behalf of the people, but you just don't fit it into the people. And it, it's just incredible the arguments that New York made, they said historically you had to have the, the king's license to bear arms. That's why, um, that's why we fought the revolution. <laughs> yeah. Lexington and Concord. Think about that scene. Throw down your arms. Um, get out of here. That's what the, the British commander said. And what did the, what did the um, militiamen do when the first shot was fired? They fired back. And the we British were no coming to seize license. their arms too. <laughs> Yeah, they were indeed, uh, Bill. And of so course, I have a <laughs> recollection of a uh, private eye television series set in Hawaii where the private eye carries a pistol. But I just, maybe they weren't having true verisimilitude there. 
that, that was probably from the 60s or 70s. And back wow. then, they probably gave permits out, but okay. not anymore. You're aging yourself, Bill, by using yes, that Bill. anecdote. I, I enjoyed that program. <laughs> that, so, that was like right after Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the thing is, New Yorkers, um, they could only get a license to carry by applying for it and l the application was then ruled upon somehow. Is that, that's how it worked? Right. You would have a judge who would have up to six months to decide. Can you imagine any other constitutional right where an official has arbitrary power to tell you whether you have, uh, you may exercise it uh, and can take six months. And, and uh, I mean, literally you had the, the licensing division in the city of New York uh, these guys were not only taking money bribes, they were taking uh, bribes in the form of tickets to the Caribbean, prostitutes, uh, ball game tickets. Honestly? Oh, yeah. There was a, a big scandal that broke out two and three years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, otherwise you have like movie stars or uh, Donald Trump. He's a billionaire, I guess. He had a permit. Uh, but your regular people who work in the kitchen till midnight and they get off and they got to go down to the subway. No, nah, <laughs> your life's not worth it. Wow. And let, this came out in an oral argument. Justice Alito said, oh, so unless I can prove that I'm going to be attacked this Thursday, I don't get a permit because the threat's not clear enough. That's what Alito said? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, the thing is that those you, you give us some egregious examples of what people did to get their licenses. Um, and those are obviously offensive. But I think the underlying issue, if I've got this right, is that it's it's not that these things were e egregious uh, examples, but that underlying them was the discretionary power, which in, which made possible those egregious examples. And so the objection is not simply to these excessive extreme cases, but to the simple fact of unguided, relatively unrestrained discretion to allow or not to allow. You're exactly right, Graham. And, and like the court said, Justice Thomas said in his opinion, imagine any other right being construed that way. So if, do you have a right to free speech or freedom of religion? Well, you've got to convince an official that you have a proper purpose and he can deny it. Uh, or you have a right against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, not so fast there. I mean, I know you're in the people. It says the people have that right. But now you've got to convince an, an official that you have that right. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking of the typical reaction of some of my friends here in Northern California who would say, well, yeah, but the right to carry a gun is totally different from the right to freedom of speech. Actually, this, this brings up a concern of mine, which is why is it so difficult to persuade people about the right to bear arms? To me, it just seems a version of the right to self-defense, and you're using equipment to do it. And yet, vast numbers, vast proportion of the American public won't accept that. What is it in their ideology, in their psychology, in their belief system, in their experience? What is it that drives so many people to have an almost obsessive, you know, shut off to any arguments about this. So, Bill, they, a lot of people live in kind of a bubble that's a fantasy world. They, they see violence on, on TV and on, in movies. Uh, the only use of guns they see is for um, in, improper or criminal purposes. They haven't been personally attacked. Um, I mean, that, that'll change you. If you're a single woman and, um, you know, you live in this bubble, everything's okay, and then somebody's trying to break in your house, 9-11's not answering the phone, or they, they say, we'll be there, but we don't know when, or there's a riot going on somewhere, so we're not taking calls. Um, they, they change their mind pretty quickly. And in fact, I think a third of the new handgun buyers uh, nationally are, are females. Which is, which is way up from previously. Uh, yeah, and, and African Americans, Latinos, I mean, the different ethnic groups, you have a lot higher percentage of, of those groups uh, buying guns these days. Uh, not to mention, generally speaking, since COVID, the riots, um, you know, the, the political maneuverings, people are buying more guns these days, and they know it's their right, and now they're confirmed in that right. But just back to your question, Bill, um, and, and, unless you see something up close, 
or if you live in a different culture, you grow up in maybe a rural area where West Virginia guns are normal. Most people have guns in West Virginia. Um, but if you're in San Francisco, most people don't have them. And, and the laws are written in a way to make it very difficult to purchase them and to own them and to carry them. Uh, we, we just have two different cultures in this country. And uh, it, it's changing somewhat, I think, the, the fact that the court would render this kind of decision, the fact that um, when people recognize what they're up against, uh, you're your own protector. I mean, it used to be when seconds count, law enforcement is minutes away. But if you remember in 2020, people would call 911 and they'd say, we're not providing service. Plus, the police are so short staffed right now. I mean, plus, they don't have a legal obligation. Maybe you'll go into this a little bit. Uh, they don't have a legal obligation to protect an individual case. I mean, if you're standing on the sidewalk and there's a policeman right next to you, he is not legally obligated to, I mean, he's probably going to protect you, but he's not, he can't be sued for not protecting you. Right. I mean, this has come up in of all things, all contexts, the, the school shootings, mm. um, the Parkland, Florida, you had people trying to, to sue, um, the police department or individual policemen, and there's no legal duty to protect. I mean, it's uh, it, it's kind of a weird situation to start with. So I get killed, and my uh, my heirs do they have a, a civil rights suit against the police? That that won't bring me back. But but no, they don't. The maybe the most famous case of that type was in Washington D.C. These women had a home invasion. They were getting raped and robbed. For several days, they kept calling the cops mm. and the cops would knock on the door and nobody would answer. So they would leave. They tried to sue. And the answer was, no, you can't do that. There's no governmental duty to protect anybody in particular. Wow. We're, we, by the way, just as a reminder, we have a lot of friends with us <clears throat> on the program listening in, watching um, uh, one of our friends named Robert on the Vimeo platform is just thanking you for being here and for enlightening us. Appreciate that, Robert. Another friend named Paul says maybe a lot of people just think they can defend on the police for defense. But as you're pointing out, maybe they can't. And when they realize that they can't, they would like to be able to protect themselves. And if they lived in New York under these laws, they would have had to gone through this whole rigmarole, even if they were totally law abiding. Right, Stephen? Right. And, and don't forget, there's an even more important purpose that the founders had in mind. They weren't just concerned with uh, individual robbers and, and uh, rapists and um, uh, murderers. They were concerned with basically killings on a mass basis. I mean, the, our founders knew the lessons of history. Government can be tyrannical. You know, there can be invaders or it could be a domestic government. And, and we see that in so many ways. Uh, we saw it under uh, the Third Reich Nazi Germany, where you had the, the government itself murdering many, many people. We see it in, in the Ukraine today, where you have this invasion force, the uh, Putin's minions are killing people right and left. And the Ukrainian government had been reluctant to liberalize its gun laws. But once that started, they were giving out automatic rifles to civilians uh, left and right and, yeah. and, and telling men, you can't leave the country. You have to stay and fight. That's right. So I have a question. And uh, so I work on schools and what curriculum they have. And we now have a curriculum called the 1619 Project. And one of its arguments and one of, or one of the arguments related to it is the idea that the right to bear arms and the Second Amendment is all related to and caused by slavery and suppression of slaves and slave persons. So I wondered if you'd comment on this claim that somehow this is the origin of this. I, I mean, I know going back to the glorious revolution in England that issues about weapons were part of people's rights, but I, you're so authoritatively knowledgeable, Steve, I think you should comment on this claim. So if you want to Google my name and Google slavery, second amendment, um, you'll find my recent article that's, um, it's online, but it'll be published by one of the Georgetown Law Reviews uh, very soon. Um, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms is about freedom, not slavery. The, the fact is, and the slaves were disarmed, just like right. they were deprived of the right to 
get an education or to uh, assemble or to freely go about in society. And so those rights, some of those rights end up getting protected in the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> and keep in mind the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, they talk about the right of the people to do different things. Freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, the right to keep and bear arms. And the fact was that slaves, particularly African Americans, were not recognized as part of the people when they were part of the people. And once slavery was abolished, we had the situation in the um, uh, the southern states. The Black Codes were enacted, trying to maintain the old slave codes that uh, African Americans could not have a gun unless they got permission of local authorities. And <laughs> The 14th Amendment to the Constitution was adopted to do away with that so that the, the right was extended to the people at large. And that's why today um, I'll make a disclosure. I filed a brief in the Supreme Court in the Bruin case with uh, on behalf of the National African-American Gun Owners Association, making a lot of these same arguments that um, this is a right that that African-Americans are entitled to um to exercise it, it, like the first amendment we, we don't say the first amendment was adopted to protect slavery because <laughs> freedom of speech by black people was suppressed the the idea which the abolitionists had in mind was we're going to extend the rights of uh, these constitutional rights these natural rights to all the people uh you wrote a book with us i think last year called securing civil rights does this address the same point Right. That was a, um, a first it started as a reprint and now it's more of an expanded edition of a book called um, uh, Freedman, the Right to Bear Arms. Uh, I'm sorry, Freedman, the 14th Amendment and the Right to Bear Arms. And it was cited, by the way, in both of the Supreme Court cases, Heller and McDonald. And, and it was all about this <clears throat> reconstruction period when the the whole impetus for um uh, adoption of the Civil Rights Act and the Freedmen's Bureau Acts of uh, 1866 and then the 14th Amendment was to protect and um, pr protect the rights of African Americans to keep in bear arms just like all other citizens. So the pro-gun control argument and the pro-slavery argument <clears throat> and the anti-civil rights argument all kind of dovetail, didn't they? Right. It depends on which people do you want to disarm right <clears throat> so you've got do you want to select ethnic groups or or people who are uh, enslaved or um uh, you know do you want to uh, you, want, you want to disarm the deplorables who are not part of the celebrity elite right uh or maybe the the people at large and only the military and the police should have arms right and we see where that gets us um totalitarianism the soviet union uh, genocide, Nazi Germany, you can go down the list, Miles, China. Uh, right. that, that's a never ending problem. And, and this whole issue goes back, you know, to the dawn of civilization. The, the debates, uh, they, they didn't have firearms in, in ancient Greece and Rome, but they sure had weapons. And, and the philosophers like Aristotle, Cicero, they, they were very attuned to this problem of uh, tyrannical government. And our founders <laughs> read that and they, um, those were inspirations for the Declaration of Independence and for the Bill of Rights and this whole idea that the people have to maintain their rights by, by force, potentially. And the only way to do that is not to let them be disarmed. One of our I, friends on Facebook uh, named Brooks says the point of the Second Amendment was to keep the government in its place. That's a nice pithy way of putting it. <clears throat> Bill, you had a comment? Yes, I have a recollection, and you gentlemen might know better than me, that uh, in the story of Samson or some other related conflict with the Philistines, the ancient Israelites found themselves without metallurgy access, that, they, that the Philistines were somehow monopolizing weapon-making technology, and that this was a complaint of the Israelites uh, as against their opponents. Yeah, I think that's true, Bill. <clears throat> I think they wanted to be able to make ghost guns. <laughs> Is that what you're getting at? <clears throat> there you go. Well, <laughs> you know, that brings me back to my sort of wry comment earlier. You know, some of my friends would say, well, yeah, it says it's a right in the in the constitutional text, but it's totally different from the right to free speech. In the case 
the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin case, <clears throat> the court majority opinion uh, made a, quite a number of references to historical sources to explain the meaning of the right in the Second Amendment to show that it really is an individual right. <clears throat> they were citing a lot of the sources that are also appearing in your recent book, The Right to Bear Arms, making me suspicious that somebody had read this book <laughs> when they were doing their historical research. Can you just briefly help me know what to say to my friends who say it's totally different from any other right and it was only to do with militia members? And your argument would be, historically, well, okay, two points. Uh, the, the reason it's uh, the constitutional rights of various kinds have dangers. The, the benefits are greater than the dangers. Um, free speech. Karl Marx published the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Adolf Hitler published Mein Kampf. I mean, how many millions of people have been killed as a result of the influences of those books? We also have the right against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, that doesn't that makes criminals get away with it, don't they? The police can't just go in and do random searches of houses and discover all the the criminal activity that's going on. And when you allow that kind of society, the police themselves become criminals. Right. So, so you have that on the one hand, and then on the militia issue, that the Second Amendment says a uh, where regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. All right, stop there a second. That's a independent proposition of what comes after it. That's a, a philosophical declaration by the founders. We don't want to have a monopoly of force where you have a standing army at the base of the federal government able to do anything they want to do to manipulate the people to enslave them. And so you have the idea that a militia, which at the time <clears throat> meant all able-bodied citizens, they would be formed and they would be well-regulated uh, by the states or even there were private militias. Um, George Washington and George Mason formed the Fairfax County Independent Militia Company in 1774 to oppose the King's militia. Um, but that, the idea there was you have a, a body of people trained to arms, able to prevent tyranny and, and invasion. And then we go on to the right of the people to keep in bear arms should not be infringed. That's obviously more general. It says the people, it doesn't say the militia when they're on duty. I mean, it's ridiculous. The argument that was invented back in about the 1960s, a collective militia right uh, argument that Justice Stevens tried to argue in favor of in the, his dissent in the Heller case, the idea that, oh, you have a right to be in the militia. I don't think so. Uh, you know, if your militia might be uh, conscripted, um, the, uh, the Militia Act of 1792 was one was mandated. And, and what bearing of arms you did was at the behest of your commanders, if you were called out to repel invasion or, or repress domestic insurrection. So uh, there, there's no right to bear arms in the militia. There's a right to keep and bear arms that pertains to all law-abiding people. And on the other hand, and unfortunately, the, the country's gotten away with reliance on the militia, but that's right there in the Second Amendment just as well. And it does not abrogate what comes after <clears throat> Yeah, that's very helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a friend named Jeffrey who's coming to us via Vimeo who says, uh, interestingly, kind of what we've been saying. He, he says, however, historically accurate the idea is that the people's right to bear arms is a check on the power of the government. Many people are very uncomfortable with this notion. How do we counter that perception? And I think what you said a moment ago, Steve, about how all constitutional rights <clears throat> carry a risk with them. None of them is risk free. Uh, and so um, that framework and the history you've given us, I think, is giving Jeffrey some things to say, and me too, on that point. So thank you. Yeah, and if I can follow up on that a little bit, um, we had this this mass shooting by this uh, dirtbag in the <clears throat> out of Texas. And so all of a sudden you have advocacy of the idea that if anybody between 18 and 20 should not be able to buy a rifle or not be able to buy a semi-automatic rifle or whatever. And I'd like to do a comparison. How many, how many uh, people in that age group hurt anybody recently? How many millions of, of people are there law abiding people who are 18, by the way, who are old enough to be cops or to lose their lives in, in the military forces? Uh, millions upon millions, and and how many of them did anything wrong? And by the way, most of these people who commit these kinds of crimes are males. How many females did that? 
how many females did anything wrong? Mm -hmm. And yet you have this idea that fortunately Congress <clears throat> totally rejected that we're going to basically um, disarm people in this age group of people who are adults, they can vote, they can serve in the military. So yes. look at perspective. I mean, most people don't do anything wrong. There's 23 million people who own AR-15 rifles. They don't do anything bad. And, and we're going to criminalize that. I, this reminds me, you bring, brought up Congress. And I think we should say something about red flag laws and sort of preemptive uh, seizure of property here. And what, what do you think about the constitutional status of those? And because of, you know, they're, they're, the, the new federal statute subsidizes states putting them in place, these sorts of laws. So traditionally states have handled uh, mental illness that creates a danger to oneself or to others by taking these people in and uh, evaluating them and then committing them to mental institution if there's a finding that the person is a danger to self or others. <laughs> and if that takes place, we have laws, particularly a federal law that says they, they cannot possess firearms if you've been committed to a mental institution, unless you're, you have your right restored by having uh, a procedure to go through where mental experts will clear you and to say you no longer have this mental problem. Uh, the problem with the red flag law, which is a recent invention, basically, is that we're going to say uh, somebody can den denounce you as being a danger to yourself or others. They can go into court and get an order depriving you of arms, confiscating your guns, even getting warrants, not based on probable cause, but based on so-called reasonable cause to go into your house and seize your arms without you even having a hearing. Wow. These are emergency protection orders, and, and they can be ob obtained by people uh, who rightly or wrongly think that you are danger to yourself or others. And what needs to be done is if somebody really is a danger to him or herself or others, they need to be taken in for mental evaluation, and we need to have <clears throat> some kind of way of holding them. I mean, I mean, you know, go back to the 60s and all the lawsuits about mental commitments are probably were some abuses, but... It made it very difficult to commit people who ought to be committed. And so we end up in this dilemma where today you have it possible to completely violate people's due process rights and Second Amendment rights by allowing, allowing their farms to be seized. And even when you go in later after your guns are taken uh, and you can possibly have a hearing it's still not the right solution because they're not doing anything for you if you really are a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and if otherwise you might just be a person who's been denounced. And then we have the problem of, you don't know why, but the cops show up at your door in the middle of the mm -hmm. night or early in the morning. And we've had people thinking that uh, uh, we don't know who these people mm -hmm. are and cops have shot people dead serving these mm -hmm. red flag orders. Mm -hmm. It's a big mess. Yeah. We should think twice if we establish a system where one private accusation not evaluated is enough to deprive persons of their rights. Sounds sounds like the beginning of the Count of Monte Cristo to me, where Edmund Dantes is denounced. Ah, yeah, <clears throat> you get denounced and suddenly you're in big trouble. Listen, we're grateful to you, Stephen Halbrook, for all the work you've done to defend constitutional rights especially in the Second Amendment. Thank you for all your scholarship, which took years of research and careful documentation, but it's paid off. Uh, you've been a champion of constitutional rights, and we appreciate it. Thank you for helping us to figure this out today. Let me just make a shout out to the Independent Institute. I mean, we've, I've worked closely with the Institute for many years, and you've done a lot of good work, and I'm proud to have uh, the fact that the Broom case cites your amicus brief as they one did, of the yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. uh, on the issue of sensitive places. So thank you for doing that. It's wonderful. Okay, uh, take care. And now I'm just going to turn the corner and welcome another friend of ours to talk about another big Supreme Court case that has just come uh, to the fore. <clears throat> and here comes our friend William J. Watkins, J.D., William J. Watkins, Jr. <clears throat> thank you, Bill Watkins, for joining us from South Carolina. Good to be with you again, my friend. You are a, 
like Stephen Halbrook, also a, a frequent guest here on Independent Outlook, and we're grateful for your help. You're a research fellow here with the Independent Institute. Uh, you wrote an early book that I love the title of Judicial Monarchs, <laughs> the case for restoring popular sovereignty. And then with Independent Institute, most recently, uh, you authored and published this book, Crossroads for Liberty, um, which I highly recommend to our friends around the country. Uh, recovering the anti-federalist values of America's first constitution. So congratulations on your hard work. Of course, you you also publish widely of uh, Christian Science Monitor, Forbes, USA Today, uh, and so forth. So welcome. And we're going to talk about the other big case that just came out last week, which is the case uh, formerly, t formerly titled uh, Dobbs versus Jackson's w Jackson Women's Health Organization. Have I got the title right, Bill? Uh, who would have ever thought we would finally see the Dobbs opinion? Yep, you have it right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And <clears throat> there are six votes against three, <clears throat> all six of whom uh, held and agreed that the Constitution did not prevent and should not be held to prevent Mississippi from uh, enacting and enforcing its 15-week uh, anti-abortion law. Now, the six votes were divided between five and one, but it's really significant to me that there were actually six votes uh, who, who said Mississippi should not be stopped from doing what it did. But as you also rightly alluded to a moment ago, Bill, uh, five of those votes actually said that the reason <clears throat> Mississippi couldn't be deprived of its jurisdiction over those things is because Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided and Casey versus Planned Parenthood Pennsylvania versus Casey, 1992 case, those were both overruled by the majority holding in this case. Pretty incredible. Before we get into the meat of it, Bill, I, I noticed that uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, uh, she lashed out afterwards and she said that already after their gun decision, uh, they have burned whatever legitimacy they may still have. They just took the last of it and set a torch to it that is to say, to their legitimacy. Uh, she says, uh, I believe we need to get some just some confidence back in our court, and that means we need more justices on the United States Supreme Court. So Senator Warren says that because of this case, the Supreme Court has no legitimacy. Um, these no legitimacy claims are pretty strong. We've been hearing them, of course, no legitimacy to the election of Joe Biden. And then four years earlier, uh, of course, uh, Mrs. Clinton said no legitimacy to the election of Donald Trump. How come everybody resorts to these no legitimacy claims? And why does it especially seem to be directed at the court right now? Well, it's too bad that Senator Warren doesn't believe in le the legitimacy of the people uh, deciding how they're going to govern themselves in the several states, uh, whether they want to have a more uh, restrictive abortion policy than Mississippi with the 15 week uh, line sort of drawn in the sand with them, or uh, a much more liberal policy as many uh, states have out there akin to almost an abortion on demand. Uh, we have to remember as the court took pains to announce, they did not ban abortion in the United States. They simply sent this issue back to the people uh, to judge for themselves how they would like to handle these matters in their respective states. Uh, this is not the end of the world, as Ms. Warren and others would indicate. It is simply allowing the people, who I suppose she believes are illegitimate sources to wield any power uh, to make up their minds themselves. I was really struck the other day after the decision, I was driving through my town here in Northern California, suburb of San Francisco, and there was a big crowd gathered at one of the intersections, and they all had all these signs, <clears throat> resist, resist, resist. They were honking horns and jumping up and down, and uh, my body, my choice, and so forth. And I was thinking to myself, I, I don't quite understand what, what they're saying. California is not uh, losing its pro-abortion legislative arrangements. <clears throat> not at all. It's only a few other states who are going to be free to enact their own laws. I guess what the people on my street corner were complaining was that people in other states were now no longer going to be forced to conform to California's values and, and politics, but somehow have their own say. They were resisting the liberation of jurisdiction 
of people in other states because the Californians, they weren't losing anything in abortion freedom that they wanted. It was a very, very odd protest. Now, unfortunately, your Californian friends and Miss Warren, uh, it's lost upon them the value of living in a federation, uh, to have federalism, to wh where there can be 50 different answers to difficult questions tailored based on the characteristics of the people, their traditions, their histories, uh, and other local and individual circumstances. They forget the value of laboratories of democracy where, uh, for example, with uh, legalized marijuana and such, where other states can watch what goes on in Colorado, for example, or other states where um, this is kosher now, and see how that does before they rush into doing something and perhaps either reject it or maybe tailor their laws based on what they're watching and learning there. There's a great value to being in a federation, but these people uh, would prefer uh, winner take all a one size fits all national government throughout the continent. And that is not what our founders envisioned. It's not what we have. Well, ex they only envisioned it with regard to where they clearly announced that certain rights of individuals were enshrined in the constitutional text. And after the 14th Amendment, even states could not violate those. And so it really comes down to the claim of rights that the uh, Roe v. Wade and subsequent cases established a, a right to decide whether or not to terminate the life of the uh, incipient person or the person, however you want to characterize it. Um, that right, if it existed in the Constitution, then the states couldn't regulate it. So, for example, we were just talking a few minutes ago about the very plainly articulated right in the Second Amendment to keep and bear arms. And when the state of New York was trying to infringe that, well, they, they couldn't because part of the constitutional agreement is that where individual rights are announced plainly in the text, then the states have to respect them. But in this case, <clears throat> the majority said the decision was mistaken uh, because they didn't actually identify uh, the right clearly defined in the Constitution. Can you explain that part of their decision making to us, Bill, how the majority showed and argued that the Constitution does not contain the alleged right to abort a pregnancy? Well, the majority was operating under the theory of substantive due process. You mean the uh, Roe v. Wade majority? <laughs> Or, or actually with the Roe v. Wade majority, but nonetheless, the majority of the Supreme Court and Dobbs mm. analyzed this issue as a matter of substantive due right. process. Mm -hmm. They did not reject the concept of substantive due process, but they applied a test, uh, which was probably most famously announced in the Glucksburg case, dealing with assisted suicide, and to determine whether the 14th Amendment's due process clause has an incorporated uh, a right, an unenumerated right, you look to see, one, is it deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions? And two, is this right essential to a scheme of ordered liberty? Uh, that's the analysis that the court uses in substantive due process cases. Um, the court obviously concluded that no, it was not uh, deeply rooted. Uh, looking at the common law where abortion was criminalized in many cases, as well as state statutes at the time of ratification of the 14th Amendment uh, that prohibited abortion. And of course, pointing out that up until 1973, when the court decided Roe, you really had a couple of knuckleheads and law review articles uh, arguing for abortion as a fundamental right, but you could not uh, trace that to any state constitutions, mm -hmm. statutes, uh, history, etc. cetera. Um, so it failed on that prong and then necessary to a scheme of ordered liberty, such as the franchise or free speech, you know, obviously not. Uh, so it failed uh, this test and that was the majority's uh, analysis on the matter. <clears throat> so I would like to raise a few questions. <laughs> so, uh, the first is has to do with the notion of ordered liberty, and uh, you know, we, of course, you don't. Griswold or the, the birth control cases are based on the Ninth Amendment 
as well as due process. And th this abortion, these abortion cases are based on due process. But we could be talking in terms of uh, Ninth Amendment rights, unenumerated rights. And we don't have to say that the right is directly that of abortion. We can say the right is a liberty right of the sort that Justice Kennedy used to talk about, or a right to bodily autonomy or bodily integrity or bodily dignity or something of this order, and that this is an unenumerated right. So there's that issue. There's also this issue of common law that you raised, and that is, although there might have been civil penalties for uh, abortion in the early years, uh, sorry, the early months of the abortion, of, of, the, of the development of the fetus, uh, there wasn't really until the quickening criminalization, although Billy mentioned criminalization under the common law. So it's a, it's a complicated issue, and that's why I think <clears throat> we're wrong to kind of dismiss Chief Justice Roberts's option of retaining Roe, yeah but saying that the Mississippi case of uh, allowing abortion up to 15 weeks yes, is not something that we should dismiss. Uh, I think we should discuss this further because I think we have plenty of people, Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> Augustine, others that differentiated between early abortion. I'm not saying they smiled on it. I'm saying they didn't view it as a mortal sin until the baby was more fully developed. So I think it's wrong to just take uh, the all or nothing approach here. And maybe there's a middle ground that Chief Justice Roberts is. Well, he, he wanted to find the middle ground, <clears throat> but he found no one to go with him to the middle ground, did he? The three on the part other of side. That was, <clears throat> part of that was expressed by Kavanaugh because the court just didn't want to hear more cases on this. And so they thought, well, this way we're going to get out of that. So I, don't, I, think I, don't, it would view be... that, I don't view that as a, you know, their job is to handle cases, difficult cases. Well, I think it would be a little unfair to say that uh, for Kavanaugh or others that it was purely a matter of institutional convenience to, to stave off a flow he of more, cases. He more or less said it. But they also made a very principled argument on the basis of, of text and of history. Um, I, I, think, I, think, I think, though, the history is not as straightforward as they're saying, as for the reasons that I just, I just gave. Uh, well, do you I think your history there are, would be good policy arguments that you could make in your state legislature um, for why in your particular state, uh, based on history and tradition, uh, maybe 15 weeks, maybe 18 <clears throat> weeks is a good line. Maybe uh, the trimester system that Judge Blackman right. no, uh, came, came up what with about, is good public policy, but, but it's not constitutional trimester? law. Well, okay, but there are <clears throat> unenumerated rights, and they can, they can be liberty rights of various sorts. Well, let me make Here's, it come. <clears throat> go ahead. I mean, go ahead, Graham. I, <laughs> Is every aspect of torture mentioned in the Constitution? Indeed not. Cruel punishments <clears throat> are mentioned. Is, is, was slavery deeply rooted in Western political tradition? Yes, although it was only was tolerated of, was, in the Constitution. <clears throat> okay, but I'm just saying it's not as simple as people are portraying it. Well, I don't know. I, I think it's simple in this regard. If we could teleport back to the first Congress, uh, as well as the ratifying bodies that adopted the Constitution, and then we could go uh, to 1868. They would say they would say that slavery is part of the Constitution and recognized, it, 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 perhaps in a way that allows for it to fade away. But it was recognized and it was, and, and it was changed with an amendment, okay, but, just like uh, if someone believes that abortion mm -hmm, is okay. a fundamental right or there's some fundamental privacy interest um, and, and contraceptives, etc. Uh, that's how we change our document. We don't let uh, five lawyers serve as a roving constitutional convention making public policy. But I think that, the birth control case. It's not obvious that if you asked at the time of the Constitution's ratification, do you understand freedom of birth control to be 
part of the rights recognized under the Constitution that they would say this. We discover the implications of fundamental rights. They they have to be really close to what was intended, but you know, this, everyone has pointed to the potential problem with rights, the unenumerated rights, but they are there and we should listen to arguments about them. Let me address the question of the common law's um, uh, apparent toleration of early abortion. Um, this has been addressed by a number of legal scholars <clears throat> who point out, as you <clears throat> excuse me, repeated a moment ago, that from the point of quickening, um, criminalization had ensued uh, virtually everywhere. Uh, quickening being, I presume, when the mother and outsiders could notice the movement and so forth in the unborn child. <clears throat> um, but others have pointed out that under the common law and under civil law, uh, that uh, abortion in the early pre-quickening period had been contrary to law in a number of respects already, such as in uh, uh, murder cases where it turned out that a pre-quickening mother was killed by you know, a murderer. Uh, the guy murderer was guilty of two murders, not just one. Similarly, in civil cases, damage to the pre-quickening fetus was recognized in civil cases as a harm, a wrong to be compensated for. And then another angle on the same point is that, um, <clears throat> while it's true that earlier thinkers you mentioned, Aquinas and, and Augustine and so forth, uh, had uh, some ambiguity as to when <clears throat> it was clear uh, that uh, killing of the preborn child was murder, <clears throat> that may be largely because um, in earlier eras, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't clear, given the state of knowledge and technology at the time, um, it was not demonstrable from an objective external vantage point uh, that a, a person, a woman, is pregnant until the quickening happened because then you could observe it objectively externally. But empirical knowledge is much greater now, <clears throat> and it is actually demonstrable from an objective external vantage point, not a subjective point, uh, that another human life is present. Uh, genetics and ultrasonography are vastly improved our state of knowledge of the actual condition and uh, nature of the, the being in question. The being has a distinct genetic identity from the beginning. Uh, its existence as a, as a living thing is uh, evident. So our knowledge is so much greater, and so therefore changes in the notion of quickening seem to follow technology and knowledge as opposed to being caught back when <clears throat> people didn't know what was happening before quickening. I, I think there are several points to make here. You, you, in your comment just now, Graham, you used the word person, but you also used the words living thing or life. And I think we have to distinguish uh, between, you know, Every, every human cell is human life. And so I think we don't, we don't want to be overly broad here. And I think that what the notion of the quickening, the notion of Aquinas talking about the form finally being there, uh, they, they are trying to get at the idea that the baby is fully human and a person. And so I think this 15 weeks thing is in this approximate period where the brain is developed, you're detecting brain waves. You're... So I think that is a reasonable thing. And I don't think we should just dismiss this notion that Chief Justice Roberts had of sticking with that Mississippi thing and not, in my view, overreaching. I don't know if we overreach when even you know black some of Blackman's clerks, uh, Lawrence Tribe, you know these are men of the left, uh, have criticized Roe as one of the worst reasoned opinions. Where sort of like you know, well, we think it's this is in the Constitution somewhere. Probably the due process clause is essentially uh, the analysis there. Uh, this I'm willing a, I'm willing to agree with that, but say what about the Ninth Amendment? As much as even were I to concede that um, the Ninth Amendment covers all sorts of natural rights, uh, I have never heard it argued that there's some natural right to terminate a pregnancy that we can some somehow find in history, traditions, 
uh, libertarian thought, uh, arguments. Uh, it is not there in the Constitution. And if it's not there, it's a matter of the several states to judge in their own constitutions. And again, they can draw lines that you make reasonable arguments on quickening. Uh, right. And that's a, a, a reasonable uh, policy to enact. My only argument is that uh, to constitutionalize that is essentially you remove all flexibility from the people in the states from uh, developing, thinking about this, taking, as Graham pointed out, uh, new information in uh, and making decisions. You have set something in stone uh, that ought not be. It's interesting to notice that uh, a Notre Dame Law School uh, uh, professor, uh, lawyer professor, Sharif Girgis, has written some really interesting analyses of these things, uh, pointing out that if the court wanted to uh, uphold Mississippi's right to restrict after 15 weeks, <clears throat> but didn't want to overturn, overturn Roe v. Wade and um, uh, Casey, there were some real obstacles there that they faced, <clears throat> and that's because of sort of the history of this of this jurisprudence. Obviously, in Roe v. Wade, 1973, reinforced by Doe versus Bolton, um, the, the court set up uh, a trimester formula. You, you could you couldn't regulate it in the first trimester. You could regulate it in the interest of maternal life in the second, and then in the third, you know, you could regulate it in the life of fetal life in the name of fetal life. But that framework, of course, was a tricky one. Uh, because it seemed to hinge upon a judgment about when fetal life could be sustained outside the womb. You may recall this famous statement from, uh, I think it was um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, yeah, in 1983, I think it was Doe versus Bolton, where she said the Roe framework, the trimester framework, is on a collision course with itself, said Sandra Day O'Connor. As medical science becomes better able to provide for the separate existence of the fetus, the point of viability has moved further and further back toward contraception. So th that- I think uh, you meant conception. I did mean conception, thank you. Back toward the point of conception, that's right. Uh, it was almost inexorable as science advances that viability would become you know, demonstrable very earlier and earlier on. So the court then in Casey switched gears and said, well, um, let's just say that there can't be any undue burdens on the right to abortion, which made it a little easier to uh, uh, avoid the problem that Sandra Day O'Connor pointed out. However, it then created another problem, which is that undue burden, while useful in some legal context, um, does not provide any bright lines of principle to distinguish really one sort of judgment from another. So leaving the court in a position, says Sharif Girgis, of having to concoct a new bright line kind of out of nothing uh, in order to somehow say that 15 weeks was okay, but then uh, other things wouldn't be. Um, it really, the, the level of specificity uh, required to vindicate Mississippi's law really precluded, says Gergis, uh, the establishment of some clear principle other than, again, judicial discretion, which isn't really a clear constitutional principle. Uh, Bill, do you understand that argument and what do you think about it? Uh, Watkins. <clears throat> no, I do completely understand the argument. Well, first of all, I would say that uh, shame on Sandra Day O'Connor uh, when in Casey, she could have joined uh, with other justices and solved this problem way back then, uh, rather than uh, essentially going to bed with Anthony Kennedy and Souter and crafting this plurality opinion uh, that the two liberals on the court joined to create the undue burden standard, uh, recognizing that Roe was faulty, and then uh, well, what's, a bur what's a due burden? What's an undue burden? It's all uh, judicial discretion, uh, unelected officials making policy there. Um, so, you know, shame on her uh, for going along uh, with this charade for so long uh, with these other justices uh, rather than letting the people uh, decide this in their various states. And of course, your argument from the beginning here, Bill Watkins, was that um, when a country, uh, when America faces really fundamental disagreements about almost insuperable uh, questions of controversy like this, there is great value in our federal system, 
which allows these things to be determined at, at a lower level uh, if the Constitution itself doesn't judge the matter plainly. Uh, we have a way of dealing with these disagreements um, rather than tearing the country apart. Uh, the That's states, how we can live together. How we can uh, manage to live together, yeah. I mean, you know, I may disagree with California's laws, but, you know, we have a decision-making process at least, and it can be followed. Uh, I wish we could have everything just right, but in a world where that can't be, maybe federalism isn't too bad a solution. No. So I think, you know, I, I'm not the only person who thinks the Ninth Amendment applies to this issue. Uh, Randy Barnett is perhaps the leading Ninth Amendment scholar in the United States, and he thinks that liberty interests of Ninth Amendment sort apply in abortion controversies. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make him right. I'm just saying it is something that is out there in the scholarly literature. And I'm also saying that, uh, yes, I'm all for federalism and have written extensively on it myself, not extens as extensively as Bill Watkins, but I just think, okay, and so, that should be in the time after 15 weeks or after quickening or after rain waves or ho however we want to lay this down. And Bill Watkins, the Ninth Amendment ought to scare us to death if we want uh, the Supreme Court uh, in their judgment and discretion, which inevitably it will be, to determine what rights are protected um, by the Ninth Amendment, I, I think it's much preferable look to look at that as a rule of construction, just like the Tenth Amendment. You know, first of all, you don't strike uh, court should not strike a statute down uh, on Tenth Amendment grounds. Either Congress has the enumerated power or it doesn't. Um, similarly, uh, with unenumerated rights, rather than using as a vehicle for the court. Uh, Congress either has the power uh, under its enumerated powers uh, to accomplish something uh, that might interfere with uh, a right, an interest, a privilege, or it doesn't. Uh, that's, I think we need to use that as a rule of construction. You know, heaven forbid uh, we have these Ivy League lawyers determining uh, using the Ninth Amendment as a weapon uh, out there. Uh, I would not be very comfortable with that. I'm much more comfortable with just using it as a good, solid rule of interpretation as with the Tenth. The nature, the problem with the Ninth Amendment is that uh, it, its content has to come from somewhere. And so an attempt to ground it in history and practice and custom and precedent is very helpful, lest it become simply a blank check for holders of judicial power. It can't be eliminated either. I think that Bill Evers is right. For example, I was disappointed uh, years ago when Judge Robert Bork referred in writing to the Ninth Amendment as an ink blot. Uh, to me, that was really an inadequate uh, way of dealing with the Ninth Amendment. In this particular matter, though, it seems to me that even if the Ninth Amendment, uh, uh, Bill Evers, even if the Ninth Amendment has a lot of space in it, shall we say, you know, you're not saying it has space for everything, but even if it has a lot of space in it, uh, it still comes down to a question of the, the most difficult issue here, which is what is the nature of the thing on behalf leg on whose behalf legislation is being enacted? And I agree. Uh, while it's true that there have been various speculative things said over the course of history as you know, when does the person emerge or theologically, when does the soul enter the preformed fetal body? You know, I don't really think that theological speculations are a good basis for law in a country like ours. I think that empirical evidence is really crucial. And the difficulty is in this case that with the preborn a child, that you really can't find a place in the continuum from the beginning of its existence when it has when it's alive and it has its own complete distinct genetic identity, different from every other cell in its mother's body, until the point that it emerges from the womb, there really is no empirically demonstrable point of distinction. And, and this makes it very difficult to handle this case because we're dealing with the natural phenomenon um, where because of the way nature exists, there's a, a one person inside another person. It, it's, it's very, nature makes it very difficult. Uh, and it's very hard, I think, especially for judges to draw some kind of a line there uh, where they say that somehow the nature of the thing has, has so fundamentally changed that it deserves legal protection before which point it didn't deserve legal protection. 
If it's not empirically de de demonstrable, it probably deserves le legal protection all the way from conception to natural death. I want to say that this is one of the most intelligent, thoughtful, non-emotionally wrought, uh, non-crazed and upset <laughs> conversations on abortion that you'll ever hear. And I think everybody here is uh, trying to find the truth and trying to reason. Uh, and I think it's worth the three of us. I did a great job on it, an extremely difficult time. Yeah, it's not easy and to I talk about I want to commend the, uh, the, uh, the two, other two of you. And I was trying to <laughs> do my best. So. Well, I think our friends uh, watching us uh, from around the country uh, and maybe around the world realize that we're doing our best to make sense of a complicated subject and, and to do justice to the different arguments. We have our, our own convictions and ideas. Uh, we also believe in human dignity and uh, civil and fraternal conversation, and you guys are good at that. Let me just give Bill Watkins kind of a final comment on the case or the subject before we sign off. Bill Watkins? My last thoughts would be if what we haven't talked about is Clarence Thomas's uh, oh, yeah, you're right. oh, man. opinion, uh, where he says he would go back and completely uh, review this whole idea of substantive due process, which again, I support insofar as what is process, but procedure. It does not have a substantive component and the court has abused due process, whether it be striking down uh, laws of the states mm. trying to help folks in the industrial revolution to you know the issues we're uh discussing today but clarence thomas is right substantive due process is an oxymoron uh this it's just a judge empowering doctrine and we need to rethink it well i mean, I, I love substantive due process i think lochner was rightly decided oh lochner was I, right yes <laughs> Well, I am concerned, you know, given the, the difficulty of this issue and uh, uh, strong feelings on various sides of it, I am concerned for the physical safety of our justices. I mean, one of them yes. almost got assassinated over this. And uh, there has been, since the release of the draft opinion and since the opinion formally was released, there's been a, a whole rash of attacks on crisis pregnancy centers, pro-life centers, Catholic churches. Um, a lot of violence has erupted um, and it's very worrisome. I think. Our commitment to the rule of law needs to be stronger than how we may differ on some of these things. And of course, we encourage uh, respect for the rule of law, which ultimately is a safeguard for the dignity and worth of every person who's part of our constitutional republic. And for the sake of that republic, um, we meet every 14 days to try and talk about these and other difficult issues. Um, I hope our friends join us again. I hope that they go for you know, resources on lots of topics to our website, independent.org. Uh, here at the Independent Institute, we try and dig deep where we can give you something meaty to consider as you evaluate your views and think about the problems of the day. And with that, uh, thank you again, Bill Watkins, taking the time from South Carolina. It's been great to be here. Wonderful to have you. And Bill Evers, thank you as always for being my partner in this process. Thank you, Graham. Okay, thanks, thank you, Bill. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope you join us next time on Independent Outlook. Take care.